and welcome everybody to the webinar on the ICD Advanced Concepts and Troubleshooting. This is the second part of a two-part ICD session, this one being for the more advanced fitters or for somebody that wants a little deeper understanding of scleral lenses and specifically the ICD FlexFit. My name is Randy Kojima, and it'll be my pleasure today to be able to share with you some of the, the thoughts related to lens construction, what we know about eye shape, uh, some of the challenges related to scleral lenses. So let's begin. Now, I should mention that this session is sponsored by ABB Optical Group in the U.S., which is the exclusive U.S. manufacturer and distributor of the ICD FlexFit, and in Canada, Canada, the two labs that are the exclusive manufacturers and distributors are Cardinal Contact Lens and Precision Technology. Here's a really awesome fit. And how did we get here? How did we end up landing with a lens that clears the central cornea, clears the peripheral cornea, clears the limbus, lands down safely and comfortably on the conge and moves very little, creating exceptional comfort. What, what did we do right here? And how is it possible to achieve this on, on all the eyes that we might fit? Well, one of the things that's helpful to understand is that we're dealing with various sagittal depths. And of course, we know that normal corneas fall within a certain range of height. In this case, if we measure 55 normal eyes, the average corneal height is 1,748 microns, about 1,750. However, if we measure keratoconic eyes, 55 keratoconic patients, they come up approximately 200 microns higher. So going from a normal eye with ocular surface disease to fitting a keratoconic patient, there's an awful good likelihood that we're going to need a deeper lens. We're going to need more sagittal depth. Now, this makes sense because we know if we have a normal cornea, it's going to have of X amount of sagittal depth. If we were to LASIK that eye, we were, were going to certainly lose some of that sagittal height. So a LASIK patient should be lower in depth than the normal. Then a pellucid patient should be slightly higher than the normal eye, while a keratoconic would be generally be higher in height than the pellucid. And then lastly, our graft patients are all over the map. They can be high, they can be low, they can be almost anywhere. We never really know with them until we put a lens on eye. But the takeaway message is that we need various sagittal depths because the surgical procedures and a vast majority of the disease affect the cornea. Now, do they affect the sclera? And does that change how we approach the landing and the limbal clearance? Well, let's look at our understanding of OCT, or what OCT has provided us to understand the eye shape. Now, most of us are pretty familiar with the cornea and what's involved in corneal shape, but we know from OCT that the peripheral cornea through the limbus and into the initial part of the sclera is best described as a tangent or an angular surface as opposed to a curved surface. So this angle that you see here is one that very much affects how we approach our scleral lenses. The higher the angle or the lower the angle, how does that change the fitting of each zone of the lens? And this is really important. So let's go through that. Now, we know that normal eyes have approximately a 38 degree angle. So that surface angle from the plane of the peripheral cornea limbus and the initial part of the sclera to the plane of the eye, let's, uh, let's call it if we could cross section off the cornea, what would this angle be? And we know that normal is 38 degrees in normal eyes and the range is from 30 degrees to 46. So 16 degrees is the highest to the lowest. Now, if we pick keratoconic patients, 
they also have an average of 38 degrees. Now, what does that mean? Well, if normal eyes and keratoconic patients have an average 38 degree scleral angle, then we don't need a whole range of steep and flat peripheral curves. The landing of the lens and the limbal clearance should remain uniform across all the trial lenses because normal eyes and keratoconic patients have the same angles. And you can see that here when we look at our range of angles for the normal and the keratoconic, it goes from basically 30 degrees in normal and keratoconic eyes to about 46 in normal and keratoconic eyes. So really, there isn't a whole lot of difference out beyond the cornea. Apparently, keratoconus is, as described in the textbooks, a corneal thinning disorder. The action is in the cornea. So that's why your trial set can be used on a normal eye with, with ocular surface disease. And if you need a higher depth lens because you have a very steep cornea or a high scleral angle, you can go up or, or down in trial lenses knowing that the landing will remain the same. So as you go to deeper and deeper lenses, you're not getting a tighter and tighter alignment zone. And this is really important. The limbal clearance zone, the limbal vault, and the scleral landing zone remains absolutely uniform across all of the trial lenses. Where they change is in a central depth because that's where all the action is. It's generally within the cornea. Now, when we have a normal scleral angle, then our standard trial lens is very likely to fit appropriately in height, likely to fit appropriately through the peripheral cornea, the limbus, and land down appropriately because the lens was constructed assuming a 38 degree normal, median, middle of the bell curve angle. But what happens when the scleral angle is low? What does that mean for your fit? Would you expect the lens to be tighter, looser? Would you expect to land at the limbus, land on the peripheral cornea? What happens when that scleral angle is much lower than the average 38 degrees? What happens if that angle is much higher than the standard 38 degrees? And as an example, I have a normal cornea, disease-free, surgery-free, it's a 44 diopter steep K roughly, but I have an incredibly high scleral angle of 43 degrees. When you fit me with the scleral lens, although I'm a normal eye, the standard trial lens needs adjustment. And that's because you've just placed that lens on an eye that falls outside of the normal range of angles. So let's talk a little bit more about the low and the high and what it means. When you have a median angle, 38 degrees normal, then your lens is likely to have the appropriate vault, the appropriately limbal clearance, and a happy and safe landing. Now, when the scleral angle is lower than average, lower than the trial set was built for, then your, the good news is that you're probably going to have good limbal vault. You may have a little more central clearance because the depth of the eye is lower than you would assume. But what's most concerning is that when you have a low scleral angle, your diagnostic lens is more likely to be tight, to impinge, to create blanching. And again, this is something we can't see unless we do a whole lot of exhaustive OCT measurements on the eye and really very few of us have enough time for that. So we place the trial lens on eye and see how it performs. When we have a tight edge, that's telling you that this patient's scleral angle is low, that it's essentially a flat surface. Now conversely, when we have a high scleral angle, the good news is we generally have a very good landing that impingement isn't likely when you have a high scleral angle. If that angle is much higher, then the depth of the eye is higher. So we're more likely to have 
inadequate vault. We may need some extra sagittal depth. But the big thing that's concerning to us is that when the patient has a high scleral angle, we're more likely to have a lens that bears down on the limbus. So modifications will be required from the standard trial set when your patient is a low scleral angle or a high scleral angle. Now the ICD FlexFit has two diameters, a 14.8 and a 16.3. The smaller being used when you have smaller eyes and less asymmetry, the larger being used as your go-to, generally the first lens you choose. Now, both of those lenses were constructed assuming the middle of the bell curve, that 38 degrees. So the standard trial lenses should work very frequently without modifications when you're dealing with the middle of the bell curve in eye shape and scleral angle. Now, when we look at studies that have assessed the toricity and asymmetry of the eye well out on the sclera, so ignoring the cornea and looking at scleral angle and elevation beyond the limbus, what we find is the closer we are to the limbus, the more symmetric the eye shape is, so less likely that you'll need a toric. The farther out you go, the more likely you're running into asymmetry and therefore a toric landing may be more called for. So the smaller the lens, you want a symmetric. The larger the lens, you may want a toric. And that's why the ICD FlexFit comes as a symmetric 14.8 and a toric or dual depth landing 16.3. You can make both of them symmetric or toric or asymmetric. You can modify from the trial set, but just know that your 14.8 trial lenses are symmetric, your 16.3 trial lenses are dual depth or toric. Now the larger 16.3 lens, as we said, is a toric and it was designed that way because we're landing way out here where the eye shape is far, the scleral shape is far more toric in nature. And the average toricity of the sclera is about 125 microns. And that's why the ICD FlexFit uses a toric landing or a dual depth landing of approximately 125 microns. You can tell the toric because it has the dual depth scribes indicating the flat meridian of the back surface. So the opposing 90 degrees would be your deepest depth where your toricity or your dual depth, um, extra sagittal depth is created. Now does the corneal astigmatism, is it predictive of the scleral astigmatism? So if you have an against the rule corneal shape, are you likely to see the lens landing against the rule as well with the scribe markers at 12 and 6 o'clock? Well, studies at Pacific University by our team and led by Beth Kenoshita looked at 20 normal eyes, all with with the rule corneal sill. So I'll repeat that one more time. 20 patients, all normalized, disease-free, simple, with the rule, corneal astigmatisms. But all those patients um, were also imaged in the sclera to understand the toricity or asymmetry of their sclera. So of the 20, seven were deemed to have asymmetric scleral toricity or asymmetric scleral shape. Four had against the rule. Remember, these were patients with with the rule corneal sill. Five had oblique sill and only four had with the rule scleral toricity. So one in five patients actually had a match of their corneal and scleral toricity. So what does this all mean to you? Well, it tells you that when you put a dual depth lens on eye and you need to apply a front toric, so when you have residual astigmatism, you can't assume where that lens is going to align, what axis it's going to stop at, because the corneal sill and the and the their associated refractive sill isn't likely to line up with the scleral toricity. So we really need to figure out where those markers are. 
And to show you this, here's a patient with, with the rule corneal astigmatism. You see the steep meridian of the eye running vertically. Let's put a dual depth lens on eye and note where it finds its resting point with the flat meridian markers called the dual depth scribes at 12 and 6 o'clock, indicating this is the flat meridian and horizontal is the steep. So it's suggesting that we have an against the rule sclera on a with the rule cornea. Now what we're going to do is rotate the lens 90 degrees off axis and see if it comes back to that same resting point. If so, then you know that you can add front tericity, but those markers must be rotationally stable. So what you're going to do is assess the lens after five minutes, note the axis of those markers. Then you're going to rotate the lens 90 degrees off axis, see if they come back to the same point. If they do, then you know you have a rotationally stable lens. It also tells you that you have really good alignment with the sclera. If the lens tericity seems to match the scleral tericity, then we really have the, an appropriate landing of that lens. So the axis of these scribe marks is what you're looking for, not whether they're 20 degrees clockwise, 20 degrees counterclockwise. You want to tell the lab what axis do those markers position at? And then when you have your residual astigmatism added, it has its own axis that's independent of the flat meridian markers, these scribe marks where the flat meridian of the sclera is. So you're going to note two things for the lab when you have residual astigmatism. Number one, where are these axis markers? In this case, they're at 93 degrees and 270 degrees. So that's the first thing. And it tells, tells the lab where the flat meridian of the back surface is going to align. Then of course, we have our overfraction with our sphere sill and axis, and we're going to put that at the appropriate uh, axis of the lens. Now, we don't always need a front torque. It's, it happens relatively often in scleral lenses. Around 30 degrees is what's been reported. Th sorry, 30% of the time is what's been reported as the percentage that we need a front toric scleral lens. Now, here's a case where we have a pellucid marginal degeneration patient, and we put the scleral lens on eye, and we're getting this over fraction, minus 1, minus 175, axis 180. Now, is that lenticular? Is it internal? Or is it possible that the lens is warped? Or is it flexing on eye? To know this, whether we actually need a front toric or whether the lens is just bending on us, what can we do to figure that out? And it's really quite easy. Just take your topographer, or if you don't have a topographer, do K's over top of the lens on eye. So you've got this residual astigmatism, minus 1, minus 175, axis 180. We we don't know if the lens is bending, so let's do case or topography over. And we determine that this anterior surface of our contact lens has 2.8 diopters of tericity. It's flexing a ton across the, the vertical meridian. So this lens is just bending and that's inducing the sill. If we could make it thicker, we might reduce that flexing and we wouldn't need a front toric lens to correct the residual sill. So let's reconstruct the lens, 0.4 millimeters thick. Now that is quite a big jump. Normally if the residual sill is minus one or less, we'd go up to a 0.35 millimeter thick. Remember, 0.3 is normal. If we had around one or less residual a cylinder, then we'd go one, uh, 0.05 uh, millimeters thicker, make it 0.35. But since we have almost two diopters of residual sill and our K readings are indicating we got 2.8 diopters of anterior surface sill, we're gonna go up to 0.4 millimeters thick. And now you can see that this patient's 
corneal sill, or let's call it lens sill over top of the lens, is only 0.4, it's less than a half diopter. And that's basically eliminated all that residual uh, cylinder that we had. So you don't always need a front toric lens. It's easier to deal with spherical optics. And when you're not sure where that residual is coming from, do topography or case over top of the lens. See if it's coming up astigmatic. Do you therefore need a torque? But when you do need a torque, it's so important that you provide the lab the two things. What axis do these dual depth markers position at? And maybe as importantly, are they rotationally stable? So in this case, the markers are at axis 155 and 335. So when the lab constructs the lens, they'll know where the lens will position and you can add your cylinder to the front surface based on the over refraction. So again, just one more time, because this often comes up at the consultation department. They do not want whether it's 10 degrees counterclockwise or 15 degrees clockwise. These markers are not meant to position at zero and 180. They're simply meant to find the flat meridian of the sclera. And that can be literally anywhere. So you need to put the diagnostic on eye, figure out where they stop and if they're stable. So don't be surprised if you have your dual depth scribes at one meridian and your refractive axis at a completely different meridian and independent of what you're dealing with for corneal sill. Now the ICD flex fit we said has two diameters and within those two really different diameters, this very small and the um, kind of normal in the middle of the bell curve of, of larger lens diameters, they both share the same four zones. So the nice thing is you don't have to rethink your philosophy when you're going from the smaller to the bigger or the bigger to the smaller. They all share the same four zones with the same four goals of each zone. And let's go through that. One of the, it's, one of the things you'll notice in a fitting set is the trial lenses go in 200 micron steps in sagittal depth. So if you've put a lens on with inadequate depth, you put on the 4400, then you want to go up to the 4600, go up 200 microns higher or or more if necessary. Conversely, if you need to go down in height to reduce the apical clearance, you'll go from 4,400 down to 4,200. Now remember that we are always thinking about sagittal depth with the ICD. What's the height of lens we need? Ignore the base curve, it's not important. What is important is the depth of the lens. So sag is the reference you're always gonna use. Then when you look at the zones, the peripheral corneal clearance zone, when changed one step, will alter the sagittal depth of the lens 25 microns. So a PCCZ of plus one increases the apical clearance 25 microns. A limbal clearance zone minus one will decrease the vault 25 microns. A scleral landing zone plus two will increase the sagittal depth 50 microns. So each zone uses a one step adjustment that equals 25 microns, which makes it easy for you to remember. If I'm going PCCZ plus four, four times 25, that's going to give me an extra 100 microns. If I order limbal clearance zone minus two, that's two times 25, I'm taking away 50 microns. Now in the various zones, of course, the first is the central clearance zone. And what we're looking for here is a lens that clears all corneal tissue. Whether we're dealing with the small or the large, the lens needs to clear the cornea and protect the epithelium. And especially if it's a diseased eye, protecting the diseased tissue. Now we can adjust the height using the base curve. So we can take our sagittal depth of lens, our let's say our, our 4,400 lens and change the associated base curve. If we go two diopters steeper, that's going to increase the 
sagittal depth, 50 microns for every diopter of base curve change. So two diopters steeper adds 100 microns to the center. If we flatten the base curve, two diopters, that takes away 100 microns from the center. So when you change base curve, you can alter the apical clearance of the lens by 50 microns per diopter. But one thing that's interesting is notice this junction point here, here, and here. If we change the base curve, we are not altering the peripheral corneal clearance zone, the limbal clearance zone, or the landing of the lens. Altering the base curve by itself simply raises or lowers the central vault of the lens. Now, as an example, if we were to put on a lens and it had too much vault, 500 microns, and the lens power worked out to be a high minus, then it might be beneficial to flatten the base curve to reduce the apical clearance and reduce the minus. So as an, if we take this example and we have 500 microns of apical clearance with a calculated lens power of minus eight, if I want to have less vault, if I I want to be 200 to 300 microns post settling vault, then I might want to flatten the sagittal depth a little bit to be in that range of two to 300 post settling. So I could go with a base curve, four diopters flatter, four times uh, 50 microns would be, I'm sorry, four diopters would change the lens by 50 microns for each diopter or a 200 micron drop in height. And that would reduce the lens power. If we go four diopters flatter using our SAM and FAP rule, we go from a minus eight power to a minus four. And we'd get our 200 microns less sagittal depth. Conversely, if we have a lens with too little apical clearance and it's a plus lens, then changing the base curve, steepening it, might reduce the plus power that we've created as well as give us more apical clearance. So if we take this example, apical clearance of 100 microns with a calculated lens power of plus eight, if we were to go four diopters steeper, then that would mean we can have a lower power of plus four and we could increase the apical clearance 200 microns. Remember, for every diopter that we change the base curve equals 50 microns in sagittal height change. Now let's go out to the next zone in the lens, the peripheral corneal clearance zone, the second zone. What does this do in the smaller and the larger lens? Well, when we alter the peripheral corneal clearance zone from the standard to minus four, we are making that angle come down. Minus meaning we're losing apical clearance. So four times 25 equals a change of 100 microns. We're reducing the apical clearance. Conversely, if we make the peripheral corneal clearance zone plus four, we're adding sagittal depth. We make the apical clearance increase by 100 microns. Now, by altering this angle in here, you're making the lens come down closer to the eye or go up farther away from the eye. But again, I want you to look at the limbal clearance zone and the scleral landing zone. Whether we use a high, uh, lower or higher peripheral corneal clearance zone, the outer two zones of the lens remain the same. So if your landing is perfect, if your limbal clearance is perfect, but you just want more or less apical clearance, you can alter the peripheral corneal clearance zone and it's independent of these outer two zones of the lens. So the peripheral corneal clearance zone can be used when we need less apical clearance or more apical clearance. Instead of changing the base curve, we can just do a simple adjustment of increasing or decreasing the peripheral corneal clearance zone. 
one of the times that you really need to modify the PCCZ or PCCZ is when you have a bulging condition. In this case, it's a bulging graft where you look at this angle and it's incredibly high. Now the scleral angle, a little on the higher side, but then the peripheral cornea and, uh, and limbus is exceptionally high. So this is a patient that may need the lens to bulge forward incredibly. And a standard adjustment you might order is plus five. And if that still lands that lens on the peripheral cornea, then you'll go up even higher up to plus 10. So make big jumps when you need to alter bearing on the peripheral cornea or the limbus. Now the limbal clearance zone, this is one that we often modify because we see these lenses laying themselves down on the limbus when you have patients with that high scleral angle. This is an example, and this is actually on my eye, where the lens has been placed on eye with the appropriate apical clearance. There's about 300 microns of post-settling apical clearance. So it's right where we want to be in the center, but peripherally that vault is inappropriate. It's hitting down on the peripheral cornea and right at the limbus. So here's a patient that we would want to increase the limbal clearance zone. Now this happens, as I said, when you have a patient with a high scleral angle. When the patient's medium or, no, or low, it's rare that you need a higher limbal clearance zone angle. It's usually on these patients that are beyond the 38 degrees in scleral angle. That's why you got to put a trial lens on eye because the only way to know unless you have an OCT to and you want to go through the exhaustive measurements to figure out what your scleral angle is 360 degrees around, it's much easier, much more efficient to just put a trial lens on and see how it appears. So here's an example where the trial lens goes on eye and it has an inappropriate clearance through the limbus and peripheral cornea. That lens hasn't settled yet, so as it sinks and settles into the conjunctiva, it's going to definitely be in bearing on the peripheral cornea and limbus. So by increasing the limbal clearance zone angle, you notice that vault is, is altered significantly. So when you have that bearing at the limbus, just increase the limbal clearance zone five steps. That's the standard adjustment. Five times 25, 125 microns. Now in this case, would you modify the limbal clearance zone? Does that lens have inadequate vault through the limbus and peripheral cornea? Should we raise that up to ensure that it's not touching down on this side? And this can be a tricky thing because you only see it on the nasal superior side. It's not 360 degrees around that it appears like touch. And it's very common to see scleral lenses ride temporal inferior. So it's very common to see thinning of the fluid nasal superior, and this is a right eye. Well, what you're going to do is the fixation change test. We see in this patient the, it, what appears to be heavy bearing down on 12 o'clock through the nasal aspect. So we ask the patient to look in the opposite direction, look down, and notice how that lens shows a real ring of, of touch. By decentering fixation, it hasn't eased that pressure on the peripheral cornea and limbus. So therefore, we need to adjust the lens. Call up the consultant and order limbal clearance zone plus five. If you change the fixation and the lens shows lots of fluorescein throughout this area, then you know it's not heavy bearing, it's benign. It's more likely just the lid force and gravity that's pushing the lens down slightly, but not in a way that is damaging the the peripheral corneal epithelium or limbus. But if you're in doubt and you're worried, this I, I don't want to send this patient home with this lens for a week without being able to be certain of the settling and, and whether it's actually bearing and could disrupt epithelium here, what you're going to do is 
remove the lens after about four hours. Go as long as you possibly can with the current lens on eye and then check for staining. If there's nothing there, then this is benign. It's just thinner than it is here. The fluid layer is so thin, you just can't make it out. And if it is actually touching, it's benign. It's just the lightest amount of rest on the peripheral cornea. So if in doubt, take the lens off, stain the cornea, see what's going on there. In this case, we see more than 180 degrees of that thinning or possible touch. When you have greater than 180 degrees, there's a good chance that you may have the lens bearing down. And sure enough, in this case, you can see that ring of where that lens is just micro rubbing on the surface of the eye over time. So we need to raise up the limbal clearance zone, get it off the limbus and off the peripheral cornea. When you raise the limbal clearance zone, that will raise the vault through the inner two zones of the lens. So you'll take it off this peripheral cornea. Now, why do we see the blanching or the tight edges in scleral lenses? Is it a problem with the lens construction? Is it an issue with the patient? And very often, it's simply the scleral angle. Remember, when you have a high scleral angle or a medium scleral angle, you're less likely to have an inappropriate landing. That lens will most likely land down and create a beautiful alignment with the, the surface. However, when you have a low scleral angle, then your lens is built for for a 38 degree angle, then it's going to come in at a much steeper, um, much steeper relationship. And that may create the blanching or the tight fit that we occasionally see. When that happens, you're going to increase the edge lift of the scleral landing zone. Now, it, if you have one acute point of blanching, a mild amount, then order scleral landing zone minus one. If the patient is just mildly uncomfortable and you can't see anything wrong, order scleral landing zone minus one. It's a small adjustment. Now it's minus to increase edge lift because if you think about any contact lens, when you increase the edge lift, what does that do to the sagittal depth? And as you re will recall, increasing edge lift reduces the sagittal depth of the lens. Now, what if we have opposing points of blanching, opposing points where the lens is tight? Well, we're going to then order scleral landing zone minus two. Two steps to create a bigger jump and make sure that edge isn't uh, inappropriately landing, that it's not diving into the surface of the tissue. Now, if you have greater than 180 degrees of blanching, then you're gonna order a scleral landing zone minus three. Now, if you only need minus one, that's one step times 25, 25 microns lost from the center, that's a pretty small amount. When you order scleral landing zone minus three, three times 25, that's 75 microns. Now we're taking away a fair amount of apical clearance. So if you need to compensate by either steepening the base curve or increasing the PCCZ plus three, then that would neutralize the loss in sagittal depth. So let me repeat that. If we had scleral landing zone minus three that was required, three steps times 25, we'd be losing 75 microns. If I go to the peripheral corneal clearance zone and add plus three, three times 25, that's 75, the two would neutralize each other and you'd end up with the same apical clearance. Now, if, you, if this is confusing, talk to the consultant. They can be very helpful with these calculations. Tell them you have severe blanching and you need to increase the edge lift, but you don't want to lose the sagittal depth that you presently have. Maybe it's perfect. So they will compensate with either a change to the peripheral corneal clearance zone or, or the base curve, or if you have inappropriate limbal clearance, they might alter that as, instead. Now, when we have a landing that's inappropriate at 
let's say two opposing sides, in this case at three and nine o'clock, we're creating blanching, but 12 and six o'clock looks good, then that might tell you that you have an inappropriate landing. We're putting extra pressure at three and nine, but we're not equalizing the pressure at 12 and six. So that is a good indication that we may not have an appropriate landing. Another thing that tells you whether you have a poor alignment with the sclera is when you have a, a successful application of the lens, it went on without a bubble, but bubbles are finding their way in. They're just squeezing their way in from the periphery and building up to create a larger mass of an air pocket. Well, you most likely have a poor alignment with the eye surface, and therefore we should be making adjustments. But how do we make adjustments? And this is a test that we want you to do. It's called the fluorescein test. And all you're going to do is apply the lens or reapply the lens without fluorescein. And then you're going to set up the slit lamp in position, paint the front surface of the lens with the fluorescein strip, and observe immediately where that fluorescein is coming in. In this case, we see at 12 and 6 o'clock, both the fluorescein and the bubbles are finding their way in. So our lens is landing at 3 and 9 o'clock, but it's lifting at 12 and 6 o'clock, allowing the ingress of both the fluorescein and little tiny air bubbles that are creating a much bigger air bubble. So if, if this patient is in a symmetric lens, we need to be in a toric. If we're in a toric, we need to adjust the toricity of that lens. So the important thing is lens needs to go on without fluorescein, no fluorescein, just saline behind the lens and then paint the front and immediately observe where that fluorescein is getting in. And generally it's subtle and it may take a bit of time before you can begin to see it coming. Sometimes you paint the front and the fluorescein just gets in there so quickly that it's difficult to observe. But do the best you can to try to figure out where is it coming in. Now, if you have a dual depth 16.3 on eye and your markers are at, let's say, 3 and 9 o'clock and the fluorescein is coming in at 12 and 6 o'clock, well, the dual depth markers tell you where the flat meridian of the sclera is. So the opposing meridian is your toric meridian. If the fluorescein is getting in where the lens is actually deeper, then you know you need more tericity. The consultant needs to work with you to increase your present tericity value. Now conversely, if these markers are at 12 and 6 o'clock, indicating that this is the flat meridian of the lens, 3 and 9 o'clock is the deep meridian of the lens, but the fluorescein is getting in near to the markers, then that tells you that the lens is landing down too heavy at the steep meridian and lifting off in the flat. Therefore, you have excessive tericity. You need to decrease the tericity or possibly go to a symmetric landing. So let's review that because this can be a, a difficult concept to get your head around. Put the lens on without fluorescein. Look where your scribe marks are. If, they're, if the fluorescein is coming in opposite the scribe marks, then you need more tericity. If the fluorescein is coming in with the scribe marks, then you have too much tericity. You need to back it off. Again, the consultant can be a lot of help. You just need to know where are the markers, where's the fluorescein coming in in relationship with those markers, and the consultants can assist through that process. Now, do we really only need a symmetric landing or a toric landing? Is that enough in scleral lenses? And the story is no, it's not. And pinguiculas have never really been in, in concern in contact lenses uh, until we started fitting scleral lenses. Because normally with a corneal GP, we're well with 
with or inside of that elevation. And when we're dealing with the soft lens, it normally just drapes over top, but the scleral lens can impinge right in the middle. It can be abutting up to the edge of that raised elevation or sitting across and, and crushing it down. So there are times when we need to alter for that raised elevation. So the ICD FlexFit allows for an asymmetric surface. We can lift up one side or drop another if bubbles are getting in just in this one quadrant and we just need to create more elevation or if we need that lens to lift up because we've got this incredibly high mass of tissue then it can be done so with each quadrant of the lens it can be altered in height and your consultant can assist with this process generally for pinguiculas we would start by raising the elevation 75 microns over the pinguecula and that's a significant jump we don't want to go too much and allow bubbles to get in where we've lifted the lens up so we might be a little conservative in how much we raise it up 75 microns is usually a starting point. Now notching is an option and this can work well when that lens is just a real issue that we can't go smaller, we can't go larger. Uh, we have to cut out a section of the lens and this can be done. But just consider that when you cut out the lens, there's a good chance that we can cut out too much and create a gap, allowing bubbles to get in there. Um, reproducibility may be a concern because it has to be hand finished. So we notch as a last resort. If you can use the asymmetric surface, then you have a better reproducibility and you're more likely to land the lens down appropriately 360 degrees around. But notching can be done when we need it. And again, it will be a worst case scenario situation. Now the, the sclera comes in many forms and when we're dealing with the smaller 14.8, those lenses are made symmetric because we land generally close to the limbus and it's very symmetric in surface. But that smaller lens could land on a toric scleral eye, maybe 10% of of the small diameter lenses need to be toric. So vast majority are going to work as symmetric, but some may need to be toric. Now, when you're using a larger diameter of lens, then you're more likely to run into more scleral tericity or asymmetry. And just be aware that any one of the three can come up for either the small or the large. Thankfully, we don't need to alter the standard trial lens parameters too, too much, but you know that it could happen and you have a fix when you need it. So your consultant, again, can be some help there. Now, fogging in scleral lenses, we've been talking about this for a long time. It's one of the Achilles heels of scleral lenses. And I would like to be able to tell you on this date in July of 2018, that there's some new insight into fogging and in scleral lenses. But as of this date, there is not. So what do we do when our scleral lenses create that buildup of particulate matter behind the lens in the uh, post lens tear film. Well, your first step is to apply the lens with preservative free artificial tear, preservative free artificial tear, instead of preservative free saline. And the idea being that thicker, more viscous fluid may abate back the onset or buildup of that fog or clouding that we see. Thankfully, toric lenses have really eliminated a lot of the fog using the larger 16.3 dual depth lenses. Be, given that they are a toric landing, it seems to create a better alignment with the eye surface and fogging is less of a concern, but it's still happening. So when it does and the preservative free artificial tear does not work, then you can reduce the apical clearance. We can remake the lens with less fluid. So take a really good reading of the apical clearance and the clearance over the, the highest point on the corner 
cornea, where is it thinnest, how much can we come afford to come down, and then the consultant can assist you in reducing that sagittal depth so you thin out that fog layer, that fluid layer. And that can be very helpful for a lot of patients, but remember that Fogging is one of those idiosyncrasies, and for some patients, no matter what we do, they continue to have that buildup within a few hours. So just doing a midday removal, refreshing the fluid, uh, putting it back in, often is a great way of getting AM to PM quality of vision. Conjunctival prolapse is something that we see in a small percentage of patients, and it looks concerning, but it appears to be relatively benign. Uh, Pat Caroline has published a few articles on the incidence of uh, conjunctival prolapse and his experience with uh, specific cases, and has really found it relatively benign. It's a little bit unsightly to the patient seeing that conch being sucked up underneath the lens and that's seen here in the OCT where you've got a lot of vault inferior with scleral lenses generally riding slightly low that creates extra fluid down here at six o'clock and that fluid has a suction force it pulls on the conjunctiva and that's how we get the the prolapse so the issue with this is if you have a lens that's close to the limbal surface at 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 9 o'clock, then we can't reduce the limbal vault at 6 o'clock without adversely altering it elsewhere. So just consider that this prolapse is a little bit of a tricky thing. We can try to reduce the limbal clearance, but reducing it here may also reduce it uh, and drop it into bearing somewhere else. Going with an asymmetric might be the answer for some of these cases, but generally prolapse is not a huge issue. The patient removes the lens and the tissue just goes right back. Now, oxygen delivery in sclerals has always been a contentious to topic uh, ever since the beginnings of scleral lenses, certainly because the early scleral lenses were made with PMMA without oxygen, any oxygen permeability. But the modern scleral lenses with their 100 DK materials and higher um, have been drawn into question related to are they providing enough oxygen permeability? And I think we can say today with the volume of studies, and there was a, a new one just recently published uh, a month ago, a, a month or so ago, that seems to be indicating the corneal swelling that we're seeing is under 4%. It's under the physiologic swelling that we normally would see if, overnight with the closed eye wear of the patient. So oxygen permeability does not appear to be a major issue in scleral lenses. Now, when you've got an old graft, one of those 1980s grafts that wasn't preserved very well when it was being harvested or after being harvested, then its endothelial cell count can be very low. And that those corneas are already close to expiring. In those cases, we do need to be more concerned about oxygen permeability, but on almost all other cases, it's really not a huge factor. It will come up, so it's something we're always cognizant of, but it's not a huge factor. When in doubt, if you're concerned, let's reduce the apical clearance. Let's reduce the thickness of uh, the fluid layer that the oxygen needs to get through, so both lens, fluid, and to the cornea. By reducing the apical clearance, that can help by a very small amount, but at least it is some help. If you can reduce the lens thickness, that might be also a concern, but just be aware that it it can be hard at times to reduce the apical clearance down to a real minimum. This is such a good example where this bulging uh, keratoconic has this incredibly high point here, but in order to clear that high spot, you end up with maybe 900 microns of fluid down here and well over 600 microns up here. So there are cases where we won't get to that target 200 to 300 of post-settling fluid. You may need to create more to ensure that you're protecting that diseased tissue. 
Now your diagnostic set is set up, as we said, according to sagittal depth. If we need a higher depth, we're going up in height. If we have too much sagittal depth, we go down in height. Your 14.8 we're using on smaller corneas and less asymmetry when you have larger eyes or more asymmetry, or if you're in doubt, start with the 16.3. Now, when you look at the normal corneas with ocular surface disease and the patients that are emerging keratoconus or post-LASIK, these are patients that can do very well in and the smaller diameter 14.8 lens. When the cornea is small, when the cornea is big and you have a post-LASIK patient, there's a good chance you need the 16.3 in order to clear over top of that peripheral cornea. So small eye and low asymmetry, we can use the smaller lens. Smaller lens is also useful when you're struggling with application and removal with the patient. But as I said, when in doubt, use the 16.3. The larger lens is more forgiving. It's easier for it to vault over top of the uh, asymmetry and the larger corneas. And in an eye like this, this keratoglobus, this incredibly deep eye, this is where we're almost certainly we're going to need the big lens to clear over top of the big vault we have. Now, when you look at your trial set, consider that your trial lens large and small is separated by about 600 microns. So if I put on the 3400 micron lens and it's just not clearing the peripheral cornea, I need a bigger lens, I just go 600 microns higher and that will tell you the appropriate 16.3 lens. Or conversely, if I put on the 4400 keratoconic lens and it looks like a monster on a small cornea with keratoconus, then I'll just subtract 600 microns and I pull out the 14.8 millimeter lens. When you're communicating with the lab, it's helpful to understand each zone. And in the center, you have your central clearance zone. Then the next zone out is your peripheral corneal clearance zone, which should run parallel to the peripheral cornea. Then your limbal clearance zone should vault through the second zone of the lens, bringing it in close apposition to the scleral landing zone, but vaulting through the limbus in between. Then the only part of the lens that should land down is the scleral landing zone. So if you understand your central clearance zone, your PCCZ or PCCZ, your limbal clearance zone or LCZ, LCZ, or lastly your scleral landing zone, SLZ or SLZ. You're always thinking microns. Your trial set is set up in 200 micron increments, so you can go up or down in height in your trial set by 200 micron steps. If you have a lens that's bearing on the central cornea before settling and you want to start with 300 to 400 microns of apical clearance, you probably want to go two trial steps deeper. You want to go up 400 microns to ensure that lens is going to clear the cornea. So generally, we're only going one step or 200 microns, but um, occasionally you're going to need to go bigger jumps. And then remember that each one of the outer three zones, one step equals 25 microns. And this isn't published, it's known more to the consultants rather than the practitioners, but you can actually do a half step adjustment. You could do a 12 and a half micron step or a 0.5 step adjustment to any of these zones. Generally in scleral lenses, 25 microns is kind of a small amount to change the lens. So we're normally making bigger jumps, but you can do a smaller if, if you so desire. Now, allow for a minimum of one hour of settling. Why? Because we, these lenses sink and settle over the entire course of the day. They are not finished settling in 59 minutes. They will continue to settle over the course of the entire wearing day. 
the longer you can go, the more sure you are that that lens won't sink into bearing in the cornea, it won't sink into bearing with the peripheral cornea or limbus, and then its landing into the conge will tell you whether it's appropriate, and that can't be seen immediately. So the longer you can allow for settling, the better. Now, if you don't have an hour, if you're rushed one day or the patient doesn't have the time, it's okay to rush to conclusions, to order your lens, and then you will assess that. And after an appropriate amount of settling time, we can determine, did we need any modifications? So do you have to have an hour? No, but the longer you go, the more certain you'll be of your first custom lens uh, parameters and therefore the first fit success. The limbal clearance zone is one that we modify with a certain degree of, of uh, frequency, and that's based on uh, dealing with those patients with a high scleral angle. When you have less than 180 degrees of thinning, it's generally not an issue, but do the fixation change test. And if you're in doubt, then take the lens off after four or more hours of settling, stain the cornea, see if there's anything there where it was, where it appears to be very close. When you see greater than 180 degrees of thinning or bearing on the peripheral cornea or limbus, then order limbal clearance zone plus five to raise the vault up through the limbus and peripheral cornea. When in doubt, go for more limbal vault. It's generally not an issue. Better to protect the limbal stem cells um, than to be concerned about prolapse. Prolapse happens so rarely. Now the the last area that it tends to be a bit of an Achilles heel for scleral lenses, in addition to the fogging, is the landing. And getting that angle right is only observable after settling. So here we have a lens, you can see its angle is coming into the surface. So clearly the underlying angle of the sclera is much flatter than the angle of this lens resulting in a steep fitting relationship and will most likely create the blanching that you see here. When your alignment is appropriate and you've matched the scleral landing zone angle to the underlying scleral angle, then we're more likely to have an appropriate edge relationship. So a small adjustment might be scleral landing zone minus one. If you have opposing sides that are blanching, scleral landing zone minus two, or consider um, altering the toricity or asymmetry of the landing. That you can talk to a consultant about. If you have greater than 180 degrees of blanching, then you're going to, or sorry, greater than 180 degrees of uh, a tight edge or blanching, then you're going to order scleral landing zone minus three, a big jump. Don't forget that fluorescein test. That can be a helpful thing when you're not sure, why am I getting bubbles coming in after a successful landing? If your lens isn't rotationally stable, then put the lens back in without fluorescein, paint the front surface, see where the fluorescein is getting in, so we can understand, do we have too little toricity or too much toricity? Are we dealing with a very asymmetric sclera? Is it the fluid only or bubbles only coming in in one quadrant of the lens. So this fluorescein test can be very helpful, but you need to communicate to the consultant, where is that fluorescein entering in relationship to the scribe marks when it's the dual depth 16.3 or the toric 16.3 lens. Those flat meridian markers or dual depth scribes, the lab and consultant needs to know where they are, what axis, again, not how many degrees counterclockwise or how many degree, degrees clock, clockwise. The consultant wants to know exactly which axis they position at and whether they're rotationally stable. So observe the lens after five minutes, mark down where these markers are. Then rotate the lens 90 degrees off axis, send the patient away for their settling time, see if they come back to the same place. Then we might even rotate them one more time and observe whether they quickly come back to the same place. When you need a front toric, 
those markers need to be rotationally stable. If they're not, you can't add the front toricity with any confidence it will stay on axis. So we want to know where do the flat meridian or dual depth scribes position, as well as what is your refractive axis. And with those two things, we can build a front torque when it's required. Don't forget though, we don't always require a front torque. Remember to map over top of your uh, lens on eye or do K readings over top of your lens on eye. If it's coming up astigmatic by greater than a half diopter, then the lens is probably flexing on eye and therefore we should go thicker. We'd normally go 0.35 thick when you've got about a diopter of flexing. If it's more than a diopter, we might go up to 0.4 millimeters thick, remembering that standard thickness is 0.3. The consultants are here to support. Now we've talked about some advanced concepts. Uh, your job is to observe each section of the lens in relationship to the anatomy. If you can communicate all the markers, all the areas where you see it of concern and where that is in relationship to eye anatomy, your consultants can assist. Apical clearance is one of those things we need good measurements of. Uh, everything is based on sagittal depth and whatever we do to modify the lens parameters, we got to be cognizant of what that apical clearance is with the current lens. And then those modifications can be made to maintain or to create the appropriate vault. But the point being, your consultants at Cardinal Precision and ABB Optical Group are there to support you through the entire process. Again, want to thank ABB as well as Cardinal and Precision for sponsoring this session. And, and thank you all for joining in.